And we'll be now be moving straight on to um, the third and topping decker of our sandwich uh, for today, which is um, a, a presentation by uh, Dr. Margaret Manford on the uh, spells and curses from uh, on, on uh, at the races in late antiquity. Um, Margaret Manford uh, moved from being a corporate lawyer to being a PhD student at uh, Lucia, where she uh, gained her uh, PhD in 2012. I should remember the year, but, uh, 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 And these um, curses were, I think, part of that. Um, apparently, she was born in Hollywood, and so not uh, inappropriately, after, after a spell of practicing on um, the television program, she is now moving into uh, real film activity with uh, shows on Pompeii and forthcoming um, Saturn. And uh, not only uh, that, but amongst her many good works, she is at the moment currently the honorary secretary of the Hellenic Society. So it is altogether uh, appropriate that she should round off this evening by talking to us by a plague on all your horses. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic, and, and good evening, everybody. And um, since I come from Hollywood, happy St. Patrick's Day. I apologise for the fact that I have got hardly any voice and a hacking cough, um, and I'll try to um, have enough of the first to get through this talk and not subject you to too much of the latter. Um, we've heard about the uh, earlier period of curses, and these, thank you, um, these ones from the race courses uh, follow them. They're Many of them are from Christian times, 1st to 6th century, and they're from the circus or hippodrome, and they relate to racing. And we have others from other competitive environments too, from stadia and amphitheatres, as well as circus, even one as far west as Caerleon. It's dastardly Welsh, as any Irish here will agree. And the aim was to use demonic or divine powers to hinder your opponents, or the ones you didn't support or hadn't bet on, and to enhance your own or your team's chances of success. Now, to show how common this sort of thing was, Augustine of Hippo, Christian bishop, former professor of rhetoric, who lived 354 to 430, wrote in his Confessions, once when I had decided to enter a competition for reciting theatrical verse, a sorcerer, Harrisbex, sent to inquire of me how much I would pay to guarantee a victory. The man was going to kill some living creatures, presumably animals, and by these honours to invite the devils to favour me. Of course, he said no, but then we don't know if he won. Well, I'm going to stick to the races, and by that I mean chariot racing. But it wouldn't have been chariot racing like that with this rather, rather elegant-looking individual who was probably a slave, 5th century BC, riding uh, in, in um, Delphi. It was more like this, as we're in the time of bread and circuses, and Juvenal, of course, didn't mean our kind of circuses, he meant chariot racing. And I just thought I'd show as part of the scene setting, uh, the uh, Papyrus published some time ago in the Pioxy volumes, 2707, which is a circus program, 5th, 6th century. And you can see that although it's so late, it still has the sort of pagan beginning for good fortune, Agathe Touche. And then a sort of victory, which would have been gods, may have been effigy of the emperor, may have been some sort of... But it, 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 the beginning isn't much different from the beginning of the races when you, you read about in Ovid. And then we had a race, then a few what we would call circus acts, then another race, then some vocalists on stilts, uh, another race, and so on. So in between the races, there were circus acts. And then looking at two other published ones, uh, in the Bingham one, we've again got uh, the same beginning, and then a race, and then acts, other things, and then a race. And on the P. Harrow one, there aren't any races at all. There are just uh, what we would call circus acts, probably because uh, racing had got too expensive down there in, in, um, in Egypt to, to keep on having all that activity on every race day. Now, in the Roman Empire and on to Byzantine times, chariot racing was huge. It was like uh, football is today. This is, this is a, a 
a mock-up, a slide of a mock-up of the Circus Maximus. There were lots of hippodromes, lots of circuses in the Roman world. Not all mon monumental ones like this, but it was a huge spectator sport. I don't think anyone's quite sure how many people would have fitted into the Circus Maximus. Pliny the Elder said 250,000, probably not as many as that, but maybe 100, 150,000. Juvenal said all Rome is in the Circus, but he may not have meant that literally. Constantinople, there it held more than 60,000 spectators. In Antioch, you could get more than 80,000 in. So these were huge crowds. If you think the Chelsea ground holds just over 41,000. And even I, I went online to find out how many seats Wembley has. And although they can, they can cover over the pitch with their rock concerts and things, it seats 90,000 at a football game. And one of the interesting facts they tell you on their website is that when the roof is closed, it has a cubic capacity of 7 billion pints of milk. That's very helpful because it's very easy <laughs> to visualise 7 billion pints. We, we, we have no idea, of course, how many pints of milk the Circus Maximus would have held had it been roofed over, which it wasn't. But it, racing was terribly popular. In Domitian's day, Suetonius tells us there were as many as 100 races a day. Now, maybe they weren't all four horse chariots racing and maybe there weren't always 12 chariots in a race but still that's a huge number of horses and charioteers and maybe the charioteers could be recycled and do more than one race like jockeys do today well the, the poor old horses probably weren't able to to run the course more than more than one race at a time huge enterprise and gradually it it it, it got um, got less than that but even in the i think by 300 a.d there were still 66 days of racing in the circus maximus Nabanius tells us there were 16 races a day in 4th century Antioch. And even in the 10th century in Constantinople, there were still eight races in a race. They say it was big business. And there was big money in it. Juvenal complains that the red driver, Lacerta, earned 100 times the fee of a lawyer. I find that particularly shocking. <laughs> um, but the, these, these guys were like, like our rock stars. They were like the sort of David Becker of the world at that time. And not to mention the, the money that must have gone on, on bets, not just on, on winnings and on the, all the associated trappings of victory. And if you look at the side, you see the, down the middle, the spina, or, or Europe, as it's called, and that there are metai at turning points at either end. Uh, and this, this thing down the middle was a good place to display spoils you've got, and there's the obelisk that Alexander, uh, Augustus brought back from, from Egypt, there in the middle, and all sorts of other things. And there's a bigger gap at the end nearest us, that's where the starting gates would have been, for room for them all to, to mill around until the, the gates were opened, and of course there were eggs or dolphins or something marking the laps. And the teams were divided into, as I'm sure you all know, factions or colours, uh, which go back a long time in Rome. I think that they may have come to the East a bit later. The earliest reference in Egypt certainly is 315. But uh, we had uh, the colours, the four colours um, were known in Rome from much earlier than that. And they didn't just apply to charioteers. Other t entertainers were in these colours too. And Everything was, well, not everything, but lots of things were competitive, and so they too were the subject of curses. There's one from Afika in Syria, third century curse, uh, which targets Huperechios, the bewigged pantomime of the blue team, which gives one the idea of a sort of widow, widow twanky like character being cursed, I'm sure pantomimes do look like that. None of the, there's a lot of debate about the political role of the factions, none of that is apparent from the curses at all. And, and this is a, a, a slide of a mosaic from the uh, National Museum in Rome, which shows the four colours, red, white, blues and greens. Procopius said that every city was divided into blues and greens in the 6th century, but I think there were, there were always four. There were always reds and whites as well, but the blues and greens became the most prominent, and, and they feature in the cursed towns. And you can see from the way the curses are that sometimes Two of the colours are working together. They use the word suntsugos, they're yoked or, or teamed with. Uh, so from Hadromata, the reds and blues are together, and the greens and whites. And from Rome, the greens and reds, and the blues and whites. And Carthage, various uh, teams up. Greens and blues, reds and whites, blues and reds. So at different times, different ones would work together. And the emperors supported different colours too. 
um, mostly the greens or the blues. I think Anastasia is possibly trying to be uncontroversial, so the reds because they weren't so popular. So it's as if there was this, this pan empire organization, it was as if there was a, a sort of an arsenal and a spurs in every city. So the same teams, part of the same great machine, were there. And there's this lovely picture, which I'm only putting on really because it's such a lovely picture, of the Antinue Charioteers, which was first published in the JHS. Uh, by Eric Turner in 1973, and you can see the you can see three other colours. You can't see a white one. You can see the others, but you can see the the ropes wound round to protect them, so that if they came crashing onto the ground, they had ropes around their chest as a sort of body armour, I suppose. And also uh, yellow belts and yellow crash helmets. So whether that was to do with health and safety, or that was just in case they were the subject of a curse and they fell on their head, they had a bit of protection. Now this does show up, um, shows where uh, curses have been found in a circus context. And you can see there's a lot clustered around the Middle East, and also around North Africa, quite a lot from Rome. Um, the ones from Rome are all uh, mostly dated 390 to 420, some maybe slightly earlier, 4th century, and they're all in Greek. The, 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 the Roman ones aren't in Latin, which, which makes people wonder, well, were the charioteers Greek? Or was it just the, the people who were, who were selling them, come on to that, um, were Greek? There's over a hundred of these have been found, and we don't always know precisely where. Sometimes uh, in Carthage and Hadromatum, they were found in a cemetery near the circus. In Caesarea, they were found in, in the arena, not far from one of the turning posts. In Antioch, they were on a, a block in the middle, uh, which was part of a foundation for a drain channel, um, which led to a main drain leading out of the Hippodrome. So again, you've got the watery idea. And in Leptis Magna, one was actually found under the starting system. And these are the most dangerous points. The, the turning points of the starting system were the most dangerous. Now, let's just talk about the different types of curses that there were. Um, and these are all the kind who are, well, people, it's a sort of prayer formula. The spells are addressed to gods or demons or spirits, asking them to restrain or bind someone um, to, to render them impossible of movement. And this, this is one uh, from Beirut. The drawing was uh, taken from Byzantium, 1952, by Marek, who published it. He drew it. I think the tablets disappeared. And you can see at the top there's a title. Um, for restraining horses and charioteers, which may have been copied out by mistake, because that would have been, you know, well, that's the one I need for this particular instance. I may not have needed the title. And then there's this, this the word Ulomo um, at the, I can't tell my right from my left, but at this side, um, which uh, Ulamon is, is some sort of a, uh, a demon word, which comes in a lot of papyri. You see, they've tried to make it into a sort of um, shape by dropping letters and moving them round. And then on the other side, we've got fricks, folks, bayaboo. Those, those words appear in lots of magical papyri, lots of cursed tablets. And then the, the figure in the middle, who looks a bit like an irritated sort of pixie, I think, standing there with his legs like that. But he's probably um, being bound. He's probably the target of the binding. And those round things are probably nails which might explain the sort of slightly irritated expression, um, and the snake eating at him um, from, from the side. And there's a reference in line six and seven there to either above or below, either below or above the earth. So they're not just aimed at the, the, the underworld, these are uh, aimed, at, aimed at, at gods and demons all over the place. And there's about 30, I think there's 35 names of horses and riders, but you can tell this is at the, directed at the Blues team. At the end of line 21, you can make out the word Kalenon, and again, at the bottom, that's the, that's the Blues. Um, you can't always tell what are horses and what are riders at these long, long lists of names. And at the bottom uh, three lines, this crab appears twice, which is probably a word for destroy based on Hebrew or Aramaic. So there's a lot of, of syncretism going on, a lot of, a lot of words deriving from different religions, different traditions being blended into these, these tablets. Now I'm going back to the map because I want to just go through, you, you, you should all have a handout um, 
due to my inability to condense things to get them onto slides, technology being beyond me, um, I thought we'd I just um, <coughs> type some out. And the first uh, from Carthage was found in the tomb of a Roman official, and this is the kind of one just to mention, which is actually directed at getting the, the, the demon of the, the dead person to work for you. So it starts off uh, ex or kids of the hostis pop une. I, I adjure you, whoever you now are, neku daimon aura, spirit of the untimely dead. And then there's a whole lot of words in lines three and four that they are known as voces mystica, which are sort of the language, the language of the demons, and they would have understood that. They brura brura marmare marmare, and so on. Which I think. It's tempting to think of it as just gibberish, but I think they probably thought that actually they were magical words and they had power. And then in line five, I ask you to, to bind the horses of the blue faction and the green that are teamed with them. And then six and seven, I've put these marks on these wet shirts which I've deposited in this vessel. So again, the, the sort of idea of water, and these have been put in the grave. And then there's, there's a lot of repetition, um, binding, the, the, the run, the power, the courage, the strength, the speed, hinder their legs, cut them up, dislocate their limbs, limbs. And then if you look at line 19, so they can't te hire on the on the next day. These are very immediate things. They're not just general curses. Somebody must have gone and put this there the night before the race that they wanted this to be to be aimed at, because they're asking for this to happen on the next day. And then they mention, the, as well as all the other general stuff, the two most dangerous bits, they're in line 21, can't get out of the starting gates, or not, but that's not enough, so you, you ask that they shouldn't be able to get out of the starting gates, and then they can't run around, and then they can't go around the turning points, lines 22 to 23. And then again we have the names, Dionysius, the blue, and Lemurus and Restigianus, and then the greens that are yoked with them, Protus and Felix and Narcissus. And then I just put the last two lines, 80 and 81, quickly, quickly, just to show you how long these things were. I mean, that's 81 lines scratched on a piece of lead. That's an awful lot of, a lot of writing. And then the next one from uh, Hadramatum in, 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 um, again in North Africa, which is, I thought we'd put in one for the Roman society, because it's a Latin one, um, but it's all, it's all the same stuff. Um, and these words were actually written round the edge of the town, so the main text was in the middle, and then there were lines round the edge, round the border, um, tie up and weigh down the horses of the blues and the reds, so they don't run, they don't obey the reins, uh, they can't move, they fall, they break, they're broken apart from one another, and the charioteers may be overturned, and they may not hold on to the reins, not be able to steer, not to restrain the horses, they may not see in front of themselves or their opponents, and they may not win, but they're overturned. Vertan, I thought, just meant turn, but that doesn't make sense, it must mean overturned here. And then from uh, another Greek one from Apamein in Syria, late 5th or early 6th century, and this started with two lines of of what are called characters. I haven't got those, but I've got this one that shows you what these sort of the, these magical signs around the edge of this one. Um, and this this one from Apamea had two lines of signs at the top, and these magical signs are actually addressed. Lord, most holy lords, characters. They're being asked to, to to bind the feet and the victory and the and the all the rest of it. And again, as as one of the ones that was discussed earlier, may they not eat or drink or sleep, and may they see, as they're leaving the starting gate, spirits of those who died prematurely, uh, spirits of those who died violently, and the fire of Hephaestus, that give them a fright, and they see fire. Um, and then all the things they can't do that would be all the tricks of the, of the trade, like not squeeze people over, not collide, not extend, not force us out, not overtake, not break off in a new direction for the entire day when they're about to race. They'll be broken, dragged on the ground, and maybe they'll be destroyed by Topos and by Zablas. And apparently, Topos is, is uh, a word which in, in the Gnostic tradition can mean uh, a demiurge or a creator. And Zablas appears in, in 6th, 7th century Coptic texts. So there's, again, there's a great mixture of sources and, and of influences. And, and one thing that I think is quite interesting is reference to the, 
um, Mesoristeros, the middle left in line four. Um, that might be sort of pole position, the one Lewis Hamilton would like to be in, or it, it might be the lead, the lead uh, jockey. Nobody, nobody's the lead horse in the team before. Nobody, nobody's quite sure. So back to juggling things here. Um, Papyrus, because all the ones that we've heard about so far and seen have been on lead or pewter or something like lead, sometimes on ostrica as well. But last year, the first one on papyrus was published. I thought we ought to have a nice holiday picture of papyrus, um, which is from the Okavango Delta, because you don't get it growing like that in Egypt, because I don't think the Nile's quite as clean as this this water here. Papyrus is, as I'm sure you all know, made from the triangular stem of the plant, which is sliced thinly, and then the pieces are, are put horizontally and vertically and banged together with a, with a, a mallet. Two other curses on lead, ta lead tablets were fine at Oxyrhynchus. Uh, one third century directed against a runner, and there is another unpublished one uh, containing a curse on horses. But this is the first uh, curse published on papyrus, but of course we've had published magical papyri for a long time, and one, PGM3, describes a long and complex ritual involving a cat, which is specifically aimed at chariot racing, as well as what wider purposes do. That you take a cat, and how you hold it still while you're doing it, you take a cat, and you drown it while reciting a formula addressed to Bastet, the Egyptian cat goddess, over its back, and then you stick little lamellae, little, little um, metal things into various orifices of this poor beast, and you write the names of the horses and the charioteers that you want to bind on a clean piece of papyrus, and you wrap that round the body, and you bury it in a tomb or grave, and you take the water that you drown the cat in, and you sprinkle that round the stadium where, you want, where the races are going to take place, while you're reciting another chant. And at the end it says, this is the ceremony with the cat, which is stronger than all other ceremonies. It binds charioteers at the races, it sends dreams, it causes the people to fall in love or to fall out with one another or to hate one another. So it's a popular um, spell, I'm sure. I'm not very popular with cats, but probably popular <laughs> people. Um, but this is the, the uh, P. oxy 5205, the, the uh, papyrus curse. And um, you can see it's a, it's a th as the editor says, it's a thick pen and it's irregular, but it's a, it's a practiced cursive hand. It looks as if the person's used to, to writing things. And I've got the original of this and of the, the other race one, if anyone wants to look at them afterwards, I've got them here. And then there's this, this list again, Saracenos, Belem, Parthion, Didim, and Nymphagipolis, by the holy names that are attached, you smite the horses of the blues, hold them back. And again, the spirit of the dead, but more Vokes Magicae, and then we've got the Archangels, Gabriel, Raphael, Michael, Buell, go off to the Hippodrome, Hippodrome full of Archangels, mighty horses, and then the Egyptian gods, Serapis, uh, Osiris. So there's a whole mixture again here, and the, the Saracenos has, has probably been Saracen, and Belem, who may refer to the, the, the Blemis, who were those warlike tribes who kept um, attacking Egypt for about a millennium. So it's the same sort of thing, and it may well have been written uh, pursuant to that cat spell. Um, so this may be the sort of thing that you that emerged at the at the end of the, the process. Now, there's, as you can see, there's there's a wide range. They're all directed at, at horses and charioteers. Some have got drawings. Some have got these magic signs. Some have got words around the edge, shapes. Some are written on both sides, some are written backwards. There's groups from the same fine, fine spots that, that refer to the same horses and riders. And we get these, these gods and demons names from all over. It's, it's always quite important to identify who you're aiming at. And sometimes the person is identified by their, by their mother's name. They find X, son of, and then it's, it's their mother, which is in, in a Roman context slightly strange. And maybe it's something a bit inverted about that. And then there's this symbolic ceiling with folding and fixing the nails, as, as Esther showed on her, telling us how to, how to make them. And you get Greek gods mentioned quite late on, full range, um, you know, Zeus, 
um, the one from Antioch, Zeus, Poseidon, and Pluto, so that's covering all the, you know, the earth and the sky and the, and the underworld. Demeter, Persephone, <coughs> Samothracian ones. The, the Roman ones, the 4th century Roman ones, are all addressed to Phrygia, which presumably means Sibylle. And there's lots and lots of repetition, um, whether it's vain repetition or not, I don't know. But when you see the length of them, it, it, they must have been written by, these weren't things that, that somebody wrote out and, and scribbled and decided to have a go at. These were written by, by professionals, professional spell makers. Some got quite elegant writing, as I said, some are very long. Uh, Cicero suggested that people sort of hung around the Circus Maximus offering to write this sort of thing. And even some look as if they may have been written in blank with, with the name to be filled in. But there must have been an industry. And then who actually deposited them? Who, who crept into the graveyard or into the, the circus the night before the racing and put these things under the starting gates? Was it the client who, who got his, assuming you, you went to a magician, I put that in quotes, and you, you got your tablet it was all rolled up and the nail was through it. Did you go off and try and put it down? Or was that part of the service? Did they deposit it? And then how would you know they did? You might have been like Coro Rigoletto who got conned. But of course, he'd been cursed, so maybe that was right. Or maybe in circuses it was put down by you know, a member of the opposing stable, because somebody who could be hanging around there um, legitimately. No, were they secret? One of the magical papyri suggests that these things have to be deposited at night, um, but and and also put somewhere where they like these drainage channels and graves where they come into contact with the other world. But how public was it? And did the target know? Was that part of it? Did you say, oh, "I've put a hex on you" to the the other rider, and then did he say, "Oh, I put one on you as well"? I mean, how how did it work? <laughs> you know, did it work? But was that part of it? Was it making it? public actually telling the person that you've done it was, was that significant? Or was it just a sort of protection racket by these people who said, well, you know, here we are, we'd all better get one, haven't we? Because otherwise we'll be at risk. And did they work? I think in, in some cases when you look at the, the ones from Bath, you think, well, maybe the person just relieved their feelings by writing this thing and they stopped having, you know, wanted to take it out personally on whoever still their bathing tunic or their gloves because they, they, they knew they the goddess uh, would avenge them. But that's not the, not the, the issue here. Um, so what, was it a sort of psychological warfare that was going on between, the, between competitors? And there were laws enacted, I mean, right from the, the, the chaos one that, that Esther showed us, there's plenty of examples of laws being passed uh, where the, to, to outlaw this sort of thing. Now, does that thing of the great volume of laws we have today, was that because people thought it might have worked? Or, or did the powers that be, the emperors, just want to try to eliminate this shady world of superstition and this sort of protection racket that was going on? And, 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 and to get away from a world, a sort of underworld, where, where, where they weren't really in, in command. And of course there must have been, people must have thought well, I think people must have thought they worked. And there must have been enough crashes and collisions and accidents in the Hippodrome for people to believe, or maybe they did. Because otherwise, the guy with his stall, secret stall or overt stall, uh, offering to write these things, he's not going to be scarpering the next day, is he? Because, because it hasn't worked. Presumably he's going to be there with some excuse about why it didn't. Or, or there was a pretty good chance that it, that it did. So, now, I was going to finish, but we haven't got a city. We're showing you the chariot race from Ben Hur, which has all these people crashing into one another, but you could see uh, the sort of thing that might have been caused by cursed tablets, and not just by Hollywood. Um, but there isn't a little CD thing in this gadget, so what will have to do with just imagining all these horses and riders crashing into one another and wondering whether, in fact, it was the curses that made them do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, correct.